the two buns. No. flooding back yes hello and welcome to another podcast from the pirate studios here in dalston my guest today has worked on and off our screens for more than 40 years from his six-year run presenting bbc's play school to co-creating and presenting the hugely popular video and tv series fun song factory He's also worked as a producer on the long-running 90s television phenomenon that was the Play Days and, of course, created and was the brains behind the iconic children's television series, The Tweenies. We are joined today by Coventry's favourite panto dame and a real icon in the world of children's TV. Ian Lutchland, be my guest. Hello, hello, how are you? Hi, Ian. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. It's a real honour and a privilege to actually be speaking to you today, so I thank you for joining me. Not at all. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, well, um, no, the pleasure is mine. It's a, it's a real honour, as I said, to be talking to a, what I would call, and I don't use this term, you know, loosely, but you are a national treasure in terms of children's TV. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it, it must be quite um, strange for you because you must have lots of people coming up to you and sort of saying, oh, yes, I know you. You were my childhood. Yeah, I mean, yes, a lot of people do still remember some of the things which uh, I, I I did. I performed in uh, and uh, it's, especially you, you mentioned Fun Song Factory there. Mm. I mean, that was that was the first time that I ever got lots of dads coming up to speak to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> because it was mostly on video. Yes. Well, we're, we're definitely uh, going to come on to the Fun Song Factory because there's a sort of interesting story about that. Perhaps it's um, quite a... You've had quite a few happy accidents, uh, I would say, in terms of how things have turned out for you. Uh, and we'll come on, yes. on to them. And the Fun Song Factory was one of those things. But I, I want to start from the sort of beginning, I guess, uh, an early um, Ian, um, because you started doing a lot of regional stuff on stage and television in Scotland. You were doing the sort of plays for today. Um, talk us through a little bit how you got into theatre work, because presenting was not something that really you wanted to do. You wanted to be what they call a, a serious actor on the stage. Yes, that's right, Sean. Um I left college in 75, mm -hmm. and I went to Royal Scots Academy of Music and Drama. Uh, I actually went to building college before that to train as a surveyor, but uh, it wasn't really me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was very lucky that I had uh, a job to go to at the end of my college uh, because I was asked to help set up a theatre company for the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. Okay. Uh, so I spent two years doing that. It was called Tie Up Theatre Company. Uh, and, we, and we were based in Inverness, and we did 12 tours of the Highlands and Islands uh, in those two years. And it was, it was then that I decided I just wanted to leave and, and become an, an actor. I just wanted to act, really. So mm. I got a job at Perth Rep uh, doing some of the season. But while I was there, I got the opportunity to do a play for today for BBC. Um, and I was, I'd never done television before at all. Uh, but I, I went to the interview and I got it. And it was, a, it was a lead in a play for today called The Plowman's Share. Um, and uh, it was full of Scottish <laughs> worthies you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew just about everybody from television that I was working with it was quite amazing yeah, okay. um, so and, and, and that was my first foray and from that I ended up doing two years of television in Scotland for regional television in Scotland 
It was, no, it was, it was all networked. Um, okay. I did two plays for today, and I did um, a series called The Square Mile of Murder. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, and I did, I, I did a, a part in a, a serial called The Camerons, where it was a, about a mining family in Fife. Right. And uh, and several other things. So I I did quite a lot of telly mm. uh, before I left Scotland. Oh, okay. So um, when you were sort of doing all of that TV in Scotland, I guess um, you were sort of told to branch out into sort of mainstream, go to London, you know, sort of get yourself out there, get yourself known. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was Robert Robertson who was the the director of Dundee Rep. I was working there at the time and uh, and I was chatting to him and he says, he said to me, Ian, just, Chris, go, just go south. He says, get, get out of the small Scottish circuit and just go south. Because he knew I was, I was kind of unhappy with what some of the, you know, some of the parts I was getting and, and he said, just go south and go to get, you know, think big. So, uh, mm. I decided to move south. Uh, in fact, the one the thing that, that brought me south was um, Bob Hamlin, who was the director of the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, had seen me do Square Mile of Murder on television. Oh. And, uh, and he offered me John Shand in What Every Woman Knows to Open the Season uh, in 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, so that brought me south. Oh, okay. Uh, and I never really went back. <laughs> well, yes, yes, of course. Um, so what was the sort of transition from you doing sort of the stuff on stage, the dramas on television, to sort of moving into, you know, children's TV? I guess um, for um, Play School, for instance, that was quite a happy coincidence because they were looking, you know, for people to audition, which was very rare at that time for the BBC to do for a children's programme. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, I was working at the Belgrade Theatre Coventry again, uh, doing a play called uh, While the Sun Shines, and uh, I worked with Chris Bramwell, who was a play school presenter at that time. Right, okay. This was a this was about 1980, 1981. Mm. And um, he said, you know, Ian, you should, you should try uh, and do uh, some presenting. He says, I think you'd be quite good at it. And at that time, we were living in a bed set in Fulham with a, a new baby and a dog. Right, okay. <laughs> and so uh, I decided to try it because, as you said, out of the blue, BBC decided to audition for Play School, which they, as they never really do very often. Yeah. So I, I, I went to an audition uh, at the BBC rehearsal rooms, and they offered me five programmes, uh, because we had to do five programmes at a time. Okay. Uh, uh, so we did five 35-minute five programmes. That's, that's the way it worked at that time. And um, I got these five. And I ended up doing play school for nine years. Yeah, people don't seem to realise that, do they? They see all the other stuff that you've done. But really, play school was a, quite a big ordeal for you. It was for many years that you presented it. Yeah, and most definitely. And it was play school. I can only thank play school for yeah, really giving me a grounding in presenting. Yeah. Uh, because it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Oh, was it really? Oh, definitely, because as I say, there were five programs at a time, and you had one week to do them. Basically, you had lunch on a Thursday with it, with the team to meet the team. Then in the afternoon, you went through all the songs for the five programs uh, in this music cupboard. Yeah. And I guess everything <laughs> and then was done as live, really, wasn't it, back then? Everything was, we had 40 minutes right. to record our... Uh, I'm sorry, we had yeah, yeah, 40 minutes to record a half-hour program uh, because it was done down a telecom line or something for some reason. And, um, really, really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so if anything drastically went wrong, you had 10 minutes maybe to, to redo something. But, uh, mm. oh, I was, I mean, five programs in five days when you only had one day's rehearsal for all five programs. Right. Uh, and then uh, while the, you know, after you'd done the camera rehearsal, 
you wanted to really record them. That's what you wanted to do, you know. Right. Camera house, I was straight into record while it was fresh. Yeah. But that's not what happened. He, he always ended up either having lunch or tea in between. Right, okay, yes. <laughs> so uh, then you come back to makeup. And while you were in makeup, the director would give you all this pile of notes, you know, like, oh, item two is a bit long. Could you just... Uh, cut uh, maybe 30 seconds off it or we're a bit short there could yeah. you add a bit there so you went into the recording with all these things buzzing around your head and it was a live it was live music it was a live band in the studio oh so you recorded everything live even the um vocals even the songs everything was live wow. everything was live yeah yeah and i guess it must have been quite um strange for you because you're entering into a program that is already very well established you know, in households, I guess, by that time. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, you had very experienced presenters like, you know, Brian, Brian Kant and, and mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Ball and yeah. Carol Chell, Carol Leader and um, Floella and people like that who were very experienced. Yeah. Um, and you, you were always teamed up. I was always teamed up with a girl, of course, but um, right. it was it was a huge, a huge learning curve. Mm. But as you said, you, you have Play School to thank now for your sort of longevity working in children's TV and branching out into other things. Yeah. I mean, while I was doing Play School, I got finger mouse oh, while yes, I was yes. still doing Play School. And I also did about four or five children's radio programs as well. Oh, did you? So I... And I did uh, some episodes of story time on BBC. So I did quite a lot of children's stuff at that time. Yes. What do you think the um, success of a program like that comes down to? Some may say that the inspiration comes from America and the likes of Sesame Street and those type of programs that have had such a longevity. What do you put Play School and those sort of variety magazine programs for children down to? Well, I think they, they, they offer something not just for the children but for the young parents as well so that they can post enjoy the program together yes. um, and there's the variety of storytelling right. um, music and movement right. um, make, um, craft makes uh, also you know the little films which we used to have to voice oh, yes, yeah. uh, you know about various things you know a bit like a, a, a program maybe about a rag and bone man or something like that right, you know yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, that was the art through the windows which was the eye to the world really oh, yes, and yes. Yeah, and we, we used to, uh, there, was, there was such a variety of stuff which was was really relevant to the preschool children. Mm. Uh, and of course, there were the toys as well, there was Humpty and Jemima and Ted, and, and, and all, there were so many relevant things for the children. I just, I just feel that children could connect with it and could relate to it. Right. Um, I think Play School has done, well, it was very, very successful over here, but it was even more so successful in Australia because, um, of course, we saw the likes of um, Trisha, who was a very uh, early um, sort of presenter at the time when she was doing Australian TV. That was sort of her break into Play School. Um, so it did make a lot of TV presenters, as you said, Fluella Benjamin, um, Baroness Fluella yeah. Benjamin, it sort of made the likes of her. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Don Spencer used to uh, present uh, the play school uh, in this country, and he also presented play school in Australia. He used to do both. Right. Wow. Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to move on a little bit um, onto some of the stuff that you do in terms of the pantomimes, because before the sort of television work happened, you were doing these sort of small pantomimes working, you know, behind the um, uh behind the uh, horse on the stage, sort of on the back and doing that sort of small little roles before you sort of worked your way up. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of pantomimes in Scotland and uh, and then when I came down, I the first pantomime I did down here, I was half of the giant and the back of the cow yes, yeah. <laughs> and the chorus. That's what I mean. yes, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've done all sorts of things in pantomime. and I played the king one year and all that sort of thing. But, but I, for the last 30 years, I've been playing Dame at the Belgrave Theatre. Yes. And you've done the Belgrave Theatre every single year for 30 years? Well, I've either done Dame and directed it and written it, or I have written it and directed it. 
uh, there was three years where I did three uh, three years where I did um, uh, Dame in Inverness. In fact, I was directing both the Coventry Panto and the Inverness Panto together <laughs> for three years. I had written both of them, and I was playing Dame in Inverness at the same time. So I was travelling backwards and forwards between Inverness yes, and Coventry yeah. for three years. Right, okay. uh, but. Uh, the only years I didn't do it was um, when I was doing Tweenies. Oh, okay, right. But in terms of the pantomime sort of circuit and that sort of thing, people, you know, you get very, very well-established actors who are very happy just sort of doing pantomime year in, year out. You know, it, it sort of helps them gap the bridge, some actors that may not be in work. But for someone like you, it's a, it's a choice for you to do pantomime and you love doing it, I guess. Oh yeah, I, I've as I say, I've done a pantomime most years of my career. Um, I love it. I just think it's 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 a a, a theatre genre that that is is very specific to this country, mm. uh, and uh, it also encapsulates much more than a than a play. With I mean, I love doing plays and drama on theatre and on television, but. Mm. Uh, pantomime has got that. You break down that fourth wall, and you you have got that contact with the audience. Yes. In fact, you don't have your full cast really until you open on the first night because the audience is so important for a pantomime. Yeah. Uh, they feel part of the cast. So I I just love the contact. I love the anarchy. I love the the freedom and just the the mm. fun of pantomime. Yeah, it's that all. It's that audience reaction that you sort of rely on. They're sort of the foil for you to sort of, you know, um, interact, as you said. And being a pantomime dame, of course, um, I'm going to ask you um, how you came from being in the back of a of a cow to being the dame. But um, also, <laughs> uh, yes, but also, um, I, I think there's a you have to distinguish between the comical character and the really serious performer who has to tell the story completely to the audience so it's not almost like this is a comical performance but you've got to have that balance so the audience know this is a this is a, we're being taken into a real fairy story here oh absolutely i i, I do believe that uh, there are story characters and there are uh, the anarchic uh, comedy characters mm. uh, and i try not to mix the two uh, because it's so important that the story characters tell the story. Yes. Uh, if we don't have a story, there's no point doing it, really. It just becomes a, a, a light entertainment. Of course. Uh, you know, show. And I, it, needs, it needs to have a story, strong characters. Yep. And, and, these, and as long as the story characters stick to that story, mm. then w that frees us up. The, the anarchic characters to weave in another story and, and cause a little bit of chaos and, and have fun with it. That's it. So I mentioned uh, uh, a little uh, earlier about you being in the back of a, a cow um, and then going, yeah. um, well, I did say horse to begin with, but um, it is a cow, um, I assure you. And then um, you were making that transition from doing those little bits and pieces to getting the uh, pantomime dame role. How did that come about? Well, I was I was down to Coventry, the Belgrade Theatre, really again, um, because I was playing quite good. I mean, like I did um, Barefoot in the Park, mm. and very, and I did Carl Magnus and a Little Night Music and things like that. So Bob knew me as a an actor and and an actor he could rely on. Mm. And then I got I I did the voice of Professor Coldheart for the Care Bears when they came to this country from America. Oh, really? Okay. I did the voice and, and I did the album with it, Randy Edelman and everything, did a couple of numbers on the album and that sort right. of thing. And the, the rock and pop promoter, Martial Arts, who decided they wanted to do a big arena tour of it, okay. which an arena tour had never been done for children before. And uh, I then played Professor Coldheart for the first time uh, um, live, really. Uh, it was because he'd always been a cartoon character. Yeah. And uh, after I'd done the first one that someone else had put together, uh, Martial Arts asked me if I would take it on and 
write and direct it for them. Oh, yeah. So I, my, myself and um, my writing partner at that time, who was a musician and who was a wonderful songwriter, mm. uh, we we put together the first Care Bear show for the tour. Uh, and I played Professor Coltart. We had written it together. We put the whole thing together. And I did that for two, we did two or three years. We did two uh, different, different stories with the Care Bears. Okay. And it was very successful. Um, and Bob Hamlin from the Belgrade Theatre saw one of them. Mm. <laughs> and he, he then said to me, see, Ian, would you like to do our pantomime? Ah. And I said, because the professor called out was very much a pantomime character. Yeah. And uh, I, he said, it'll only be two years. I only give people two years. Uh, he said, but if you want to come and do it, then you can write it and direct it. So in 1987, I, I wrote my first panto for the Belgrade. And I wanted to play the baddie. <laughs> right, okay. Yes. Uh, and we couldn't really... F- <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. I think Bob, Bob Hamlin was the same. Yeah. And we couldn't really find the dame we wanted. So he turned around and said, right, Ian, you're going to have to play dame. Right. I said, what? I'm too young to play dame. I can't play dame. <laughs> uh, right, right. Yes, yes. So he said, yeah, yeah, you play that. So I ended up playing that my first dame. And we got someone else as the baddie for my first year. And then we did the second year, and I played Dame again. Right. And uh, then he offered us, he offered me another year. Mm-hmm. And it went on like that. And then I, he says, right, Ian, we want to try and make you our regular Dame. So I was offered five years kind of thing. Right. So I've been doing it ever since. Wow. Well, I, I definitely need to take a trip to the Belgrave Theatre to see you doing Panto. I know that it's, um, I don't know whether it's been possible for you recently because of the times you're in to do pantomime. We are doing, we're definitely doing one this year. We did a digital one last year in my TV studio. Oh, wow. Okay. At, yeah, we did a digital one and we right. put it online for streaming. Yes. But this year we're, we're back doing a live Panto. Oh, I bet you can't wait to get back and do that. Can't wait. Can't wait. I, I felt, <laughs> last year, I felt very envious of the um, people that were able to go and do the pantomimes last year. People in uh, Devon and sort of around that West Country yeah. who were very able to do pantomime socially distanced. And um, you, as far as I'm aware, you're a big advocate, and I agree with this, um, in terms of getting different stories out there because we always see the Cinderella's and the Sleeping Beauties and you know there's there's room for so many different stories that can be brought to pantomime isn't there? Yeah definitely I mean I uh, introduced because uh, because you're right a lot of theatres just do kind of the five yeah and uh, then when they do the five they repeat them again and yeah. and I, I introduced Beauty and the Beast actually to the Belgrade and we've done it two or three times now oh, yeah. and I, I introduced uh, Puss in Boots oh, yes. and it went, it went down very well um, and I wanted to do, this year I wanted to do Sinbad oh, wow. The Adventures of Sinbad which amazing. is, oh it's a fantastic story, it's got yes. so many creatures in it and yeah. it's, uh, it's just that. great yeah. but I, I can't, I, I I can't get the marketing department to, to agree with me, so... Uh. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's do a, a protest here now and say we want to see Sinbad. I mean, there's so many... One of the lovely, lovely fable stories that I adored even growing up as a child was a, a, a story by Oscar Wilde, and it was called The Selfish Giant. And oh, yes. I really, really wanted to see... Uh, a pantomime based on that story because I just think there's so many characters in that. There's room for um, songs, stories. I think that's what yeah. I'd like to see. Um, so, and, lo- and there's lots of children in it as well, yeah. yeah. Um, I just think, you know, and it's all very well, you know, they say every pantomime is different because you have a different cast and, you know, you have a different audience coming and the audience sort of bring their day with them and how they feel. Um, that's how an audience sort of works. But I think you are right. We need to see a more diverse array of different pantomimes that don't just sort of show the the same story. Um, so hopefully, no, absolutely. hopefully we'll get... Um, Sinbad going um, as you have the <laughs> other plays 
because I know they're doing a, I think they did the one of the plays you mentioned at the Palladium. You know, if you're going to support a theatre, go to your local theatre and really support that because it's really important because you all agree that this particular industry in these times have been really hit quite hard. Oh, this last year has been devastating for theatres and for people who work in theatre yeah. and live events. It's been absolutely dreadful. It's going to take a long time to recover. It almost and seems I, like over the last year or so, you know, the theatres have been branded as the forgotten ones. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of people have left the business, you know. Right. Uh, you know, because you, you, you try and find people like lighting designers or sound designers and in some way, I, I, some people that, that I know have, have just given up, just left the business and done something else. Well, that's sad. But um, yeah. But we will, we will get back. We will bounce back. Yeah. How long does it normally take you to dress up as a dame? Oh, not very long, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're so used to it, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. I I start doing my makeup on probably at the quarter. <laughs> oh, right, okay, yes, yes, right, I see. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, as we said, we, we really hope to get the theatres back up and running and see live theatre across all genres um, and to support your local theatre. So we're going to move on. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah, I agree. So um, we are going to move on now to sort of, you know, you've done the sort of theatre and that sort of thing. Um and we've spoken previously about play school and all of that sort of stuff, but you really didn't like the idea of becoming a TV presenter, did you? You wanted to be a, a quite a serious actor, isn't it? I tried very hard. Right, <laughs> I okay. tried. I mean, I, as I said, before I left Scotland, I was doing lots of theatre, mm -hmm. some decent parts, and also lots of telly. Right. And uh, when I came down south, I just couldn't break into television drama at all. Uh, I found it really, really hard. I, I just missed out on a couple of big things. Mm. Um, and if it had happened, probably everything would have been quite different. But um, I just had such a hard job trying to get into, into television. As, as And I, I tried very hard to keep my acting going yeah. as well as presenting. Because I didn't want to just be a presenter. Yeah, uh, I wanted to be an actor as well. And I, I have... I've done, I mean, I could keep the theatre stuff going, which was easy enough. It was just it was just getting into television. It was really, really hard. Right, and I guess it's difficult to sort of, if you become a presenter, I guess more so in children's television, it's quite a, it's quite a small niche sort of market that you're targeting and has quite a, often a short shelf life in terms of how long people can, can stay being children's TV presenters. Yeah, I mean, the... the Look, certainly when I was a presenter, it was very much, uh, I suppose that the emphasis was on younger presenters. Right. Uh, now, nowadays, it's a little bit, little bit different because you've got one or two older presenters still working, which is really good. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's important. And in fact, when I took over play school, I play days. Right. Okay. I, I became the producer of three of the Play Days programs. Right. And we, Will and I rewrote, we, they wanted to get rid of the tent stop and replace it with Poppy, well, with, with something else. Oh, so we, 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 yeah, we created Poppy Stop, okay. which was a cat. So it was just sort of like a little sitcom, really. And uh, we created that. And that, we, we were very, Keen to introduce a grandfather character into that program, uh, Grandpa Grandpa Jones, because we, I just felt that a lot of young, very young children spend a lot of time with their grandparents. Yeah, yeah. And so we wanted to introduce that. So I, I I'm a great lover in introducing older people in, into into presenting. I think we should have a, a real balance. Yeah, it should be uh, it should be very diverse. It's interesting you mentioned play days because um, as I remember it was quite groundbreaking for its time, wasn't it? Yes, it was, it was Cynthia Felgate who, who actually created Play School. She left the BBC and started her own production company. Right. And she got, she got the contract to do play days. Yes. Uh, she introduced it was her that introduced it and, and she actually made a ruling that uh, 
the, or the, 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 the play school play school presenters would not be appearing in play days. Oh. Yeah, she didn't want the play school presenters. She wanted a whole r- r- ranch, a tranche of uh, an old rack of uh, new young presenters. Right. And uh, so for the first three months, I suppose, of play days, play there was a lot of new presenters. Really? Oh, play bus, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we had to change it. <laughs> uh, the charity play bus, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, there was quite a lot of new presenters uh, who were very inexperienced, I have to say. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was after three months I got a call to to say, you know, to come and do some stories. Right. Um. Not be not to be on screen, but just to tell some stories voice uh, voice wise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she wasn't going to have me on screen, right. so uh, <laughs> which I did do, mm-hmm. and um, uh, from there I got uh, for the roundabout stop, which um, Claire Bradley was the producer of. She asked me to do a character called Morton McEwen, okay. who was a, a mad Scottish inventor okay. with a, a little son. I had a son called Minnie McEwen. Right. And, uh, and we, I did a few episodes of Roundabout Stop. Okay. And then I did some Ten Stop. Ah. And I was, yeah, so I was in vision after all. And, um, well, there we go. So, so after that, uh, they wanted to do a, a lo- well, they wanted to do a live show of play days, and they weren't really sure how to do it. Uh, okay, yes, I remember. So they asked me if I would do the live sh- a live show. So I presented the first place play days live show at, at the at the uh, Polka Theatre in Wimbledon. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. It was the very first one we did. We packed it out. And uh, it went really, really well. And from that job, from me produ- directing and writing that first live show for Play Days, right. I was offered producer to be a producer of one of the Play Days programs. Wow, okay, I see. So I did, the first one was, they wanted to change, well, they wanted to redo the roundabout stop, so, so I took over the roundabout stop. But then I eventually took over the Wybird stop and then Tent stop, which became Poppy stop. Oh, so I did three of them, yeah. Right. Oh, that's interesting you say that, mother of your listening. All of these shows were happening at the Polka Theatre while I was watching Postman Pat. Um, I wish I was <laughs> with all these shows. Um, goodness me, um, if only I had known. But um, people of that sort of generation will we'll really have fond memories. And I guess, like most programmes, you know, there are lots of people who started out on Play Days that went on to do amazing things. You know, for instance, Dave Benson Phillips started on Play Days and he says often that he has that to sort of thank for getting into all of the other shows that he did. One of them, of course, which was uh, the show that you sort of fronted and created, and that was the fun song factory and i guess again we're looking that was sort of a happy accident because it was uh all for a a a charitable cause wasn't it it was a video to produce for the preschool learning allowance to help them with their funds and then from there it sort of took off as this phenomenal show yeah i mean it was it was an an odd one fun song um because we we will and i had written a program and we pitched it to someone and they took it, and we were really pleased about it. And then we realized very soon they'd taken it just to shelve it because they had a program was quite similar, so they wanted to take cars off the market. Right, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so we were really, really annoyed about that. And we came home to Will's house, I remember that day, and we sat down and we wrote a fun song factory. Um, and uh, I, w- I was very – I did a lot for Preschool Learning Alliance at that time. Okay. And they were very keen to be kind of part of it and uh, and help me through it. But we needed to get someone who who would distribute it for us, right? Because we decided we would just make a video. You know, that's that was that was our plan. We hadn't any plan for a TV program okay. or for any more videos. We want we chose pro, uh, songs, and the whole idea was that we wanted to try and make really good 
versions of all the action songs for preschool children. Yeah. Because a lot of the young parents that were coming through didn't know the words and they didn't know the tunes and they didn't know the actions. I see. And so we, we started to collect all the songs and we wanted to do a, 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 just a, a video so that we could, people could watch it and, um, and learn how, you know, keep the songs alive. Yeah. And that was through the, the, the Preschool Learning Alliance as well. And uh, eventually we found Abbey Home Entertainment who, who distributed videos and they were quite keen to do it. So they helped us out with the budget and we made one video. There you go. That's how Which we did it. Out. We did it at the Polka Theatre in Wimbledon again. Ah, yes, you keep me that. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Um, just on my doorstep. But yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, I, I, re- I, I remember um, because you did the first video and that was a, a huge, huge success because videos back then were, you know, for people like me, were a real treat if you could go out and buy a video, and especially one yeah. that wasn't broadcast on any network. It was just a direct-to-video. You relied solely on the sales of yes. um, of the video. So talk us through, because everything was, you know, as we could see, it was live, and you had an audience there. So I guess that audience, to start with, were an audience that were just welcomed for the um, video recording. Yes. We decided to do it in a the theatre. Right. Uh, because we wanted a live audience, right? Uh, and because we wanted to see the children doing all the actions, yes, as well as the presenters on stage, and and you know, theatre was our background as well, right? So we decided to do that. Will Brenton was trained as a television director. Okay, I was uh, I was a theatre director, and and I knew about theatre, yeah. and so we just. We did, we did. We just decided to to do that to, to film it in a theatre, okay. and we invited the audience, and we that it just worked a treat. Yes. Uh, um, you know, the audience were love. They loved it, uh, and you know, um, and Miles at Abbey Home Entertainment wanted more videos. She said it's going so well. I think she do another one. Yeah. and um, we decided to do it at the Chicken Shed Theatre in North London. Yes. which is a theatre which encourages disabled children to be part of the theatre okay. group. So we decided to do the second one in their theatre. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, and, but after we did that one, uh, we, the third one we decided to then take it into a TV studio ah. because we were more in control of the sound and the lights and all that sort of stuff. It was much more controllable. Right. So we invited an audience into the TV studio. Right. And we did all the other t- fun song factories we did in the television studio. Ah, okay. Well, that, I didn't know yeah. that. That's quite interesting. And how, so how, yeah. how many video uh, releases did you actually produce of the original sort of live action fun song factory? That's a good point. How many did we do? Seven. Okay. I was about, but there were lots of other because they started doing compilations and uh, oh, wow. uh, special special Christmas versions and all sorts of things, you know. Right. Uh, so uh, we did we did quite a, a, a range of them. I see. And it, and it had quite a diverse array of presenters. Of course, yourself and Dave were a fixture throughout all of the video releases, but you had lots of other people uh, coming in to uh, perform with you, didn't you? Yes, we did. Uh, we had uh, Sarah Davidson originally, uh, yes, yeah. who, who was a presenter with us, and uh, she she moved to, to Spain. Right. Um, and we had Michelle Derla. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, but Michelle died, unfortunately, you know, so very sadly. Oh, did she? Oh. Yes. And uh, oh. we, had, we had various presenters. Uh, we had Katie Stevens. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, she was lovely. Uh, and just, just really, really quite, as you say, Dave and I were kind of fixtures. Yes. Um, and, um, and the children. We, we, we got children from... Uh, Bonnie Langford's mum's dance school. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, 
some of the children grew up with us, you know, sort of like little Dale started off as a little, tiny little lad, and you see him growing through the videos. Yes. <laughs> some of the, like, one or two of the kids, and I know, uh, are now starring in the West End. Wow, okay, yes. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. I, I think I remember, see, see, I remember yeah. Little Dale. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, and uh, I'm just amazing, really. Just uh, some of the children have come through and have gone into the business and, you know, sometimes bump into them. Oh, wow, that must be amazing when you sort of come across, you know, some... Yeah, I come, I, you know, when I'm auditioning for Panto and things. Oh, really? Okay. You, yeah. Sometimes some of the kids, when well, the kids come and see you, I, I did fun song factory with you, and I went, my God. Oh, yes, <laughs> oh, yes, I remember you now, yeah. Um, but you're only this, this sort of high. Um, you know, That's oh, right. I, I, was, I was very sad to hear about um, Michelle, because I remember Michelle. Um, I think she was in, yeah. she was in the second uh, yes. live performance. And, uh, and also, you mentioned Dave, of course, and I think Dave was a perfect foil for all of you, because he, he was a sort of character that played to the parents as well as the um, children. Yes. He was a sort of yeah, a comic character that would come out and he wouldn't mind having a laugh and he wore these vibrant shirts and he would come on in yeah. a wig <laughs> and he would dance about. And I think the one thing I remember with Dave is that the parents, even at home watching the video with their children, absolutely loved Dave. They fell in love with him. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He's, he was absolutely amazing. Yeah. And still, and still going strong. He certainly is. Um, <laughs> he certainly is. And what do you think about that sort of, you know, the way you produce the shows? You wanted to make it, uh, I guess, a family show because I guess you would have sort of parents or older siblings in the audience with their children, and maybe some of yeah. the parents would recognise you from play school. And I guess there's a, a there's got to be some sort of um, storyline that plays to everybody and not just the young children. Definitely, I, I, I've always felt that that growing up, some you know, I like to watch programmes with children, with, with the children sometimes. Yeah, and and I, and I think this should be. It was the same when we did the Twinnies. We we what we wanted to make programmes that were watchable by the by the by the, the mums and dads as well. And it, and it hit a chord as well for for uh, Down syndrome children and oh, right. and. It, it really hit a chord with with with, with those children. Uh, I st I still have teenage a couple of teenage lads come to see me in Panto every single year. Oh wow! Who were brought up with Fun Song Factory, and it was Fun Song Factory. They are still Fun Song Factory mad. <laughs> um, and it's as I say, it was the first time that dads ever noticed me because it was always mums that saw me because yes, right. they were at home with the kids and. Yes. Dads used to shout, oh, you, you, you live with us. You <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're in our homes and we're on video and we have to rewind you every time. Um, that's the great thing with videos. Oh, wonderful, wonderful memories. And uh, as we go down the line with the Fun Song Factory, we're going from the live sort of shows that were direct to video. And then, you know, we get to see it on our small screens uh, years later in a television series. Yeah. How did that come about? And and that was Justin. Justin then became Justin Fletcher became yes, part yeah, of it. Yeah. Then that's right. Well, it was just that it was GMTV. I think that that, that wanted it, and uh, okay. they decided they were going to put it on. They, but they they didn't want me to present it. Oh really? Okay. No, they wouldn't let me. Oh, well, I see. Okay. No, I seem to remember that you weren't sort of the presenter of that. It was, I mean, Dave, Dave um, was in it and you sort of, uh, you know. Dave, yeah, story. Dave and Justin and people like that, yeah, and, and Carl and Carl Woolley. Oh, that's right. That's... Uh, so, I mean, we, I, I, yeah, I didn't get the chance to present. I wanted to, but uh, they wouldn't let me. Oh, uh, okay. So, I see. so I just produced it. I produced it. Going into the studio, you didn't have an audience then, did you, when you were doing it on the no. television? So no. It was very much... No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there was lots of things about it that I wasn't terribly happy with because I wanted a live audience in the studio right. and they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have it. Um, oh, and yeah. I wanted to be present it and they wouldn't have it. So it was, um, it was quite a difficult time, I remember. Right. 
um, the decision not to have an audience because that that had proven to be very well. You have to look at um, shows like The Singing Kettle, for instance, that were proven yeah. to have the audience while they were doing the shows, and that was very successful. So, what was their, you know, why were they hesitant to have an audience in? It was the producer. It was the producer who who was in charge of the whole thing. She just didn't want. She had her own ideas about what she wanted, and uh, right. uh, and that was it. You know, we either did it her way or not at all. <laughs> well, e- either way, it still has. You know, I still hold very, very fond memories of both of those shows, um, whether yeah. it was in the audience or on the television. Um, and as you said, it created the likes of you know Justin Fletcher. He was a very young, very um, slender Justin Fletcher back then that people may not recognise. <laughs> People seem to <laughs> yes, but it's 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 strange because a lot of people don't know that Justin sort of started out on the Fun Song Factory, and of course you were mentioning Play Days uh, previously. People might be interested to know that he went on tour with Play Days as well, playing Mr Jolly. So there's lots. He of, did, yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of um, things that Justin has done prior to doing the sort of something special and that sort of thing that he does now. And he was. A, I mean, that was his. Diverse. That was his first job out of college. I. Guess. I gave him his first job out of college uh, as Mr. Tumble on the live tour. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jo- Mr. Jolly. Mr. Jolly, yes. yes too on, on the live tour. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and people still very fondly remember the Fun Song Factory because, of course, years later, it was brought back again, I guess, in the format that you wanted it to be because it was with an audience. Yes. And then... From that, we managed to get a very famous JLS star. <laughs> yes, that's right. Where, uh, Aston, yes. Yeah. Yes, I took, I, took, I took Aston out of school for that. Did you? Um, yeah, he, he wa- I mean, he wanted to be a performer. Right. Uh, but his mum and dad weren't sure about it. So I had to speak to his mum and dad. Right. Uh, I called, called them up to the studio and said, look, of course, it's your decision, yeah. Um, and and Aston, but I would love him for this program. Yeah. And uh, if if you if if you don't mind, you know, if if you can if you can afford to come out of school for a while, then then I'd like to. And he he came out and then and uh, he just he just you know, decided to go into the business. I personally, you know, as a sort of viewer, as somebody now, I think it sort of lost that charm that it had. Originally. Yeah, it didn't have the charm. It, you're right. It, absolutely right. It, because we were concentrating so much on young, trendy presenters right. um, who are really pop singers rather than, than, than children's presenters, right. um, we, it, it, it lost a lot of its charm. Right. Um, and that sort of yeah. moves us swiftly on after the sort of Fun Song Factory because a lot of those songs uh, that were in the Fun Song Factory sort of moved over to one of the biggest creations for you, and that was the Tweenies. Yes. Yeah, and that was um, that was first broadcast in 1998, I think, wasn't it? Yes, that's, uh, in 1999. Uh, uh, Christmas, uh, so it was Christmas of 99 it went out. Oh, was it really? Okay. Yeah, and uh, it was... Well, we didn't know uh, how... It, how it was going to go, really? No. Because uh, I mean, Teletubbies had done so well, right? Uh, for the BBC, uh, but originally it was supposed to to do from not to five years old. You see, I see. And uh, but it was obvious it wasn't going to do that because it was very young. Yeah. And so the BBC realised they needed another program to go from three to five year olds, uh, and they made quite a lot of money out. Of t- so they decided to commission another series. Okay. Um, and we were, we actually weren't asked to put an idea in at all. Um, although we had been, both Will and I had been working on play days. Um, but um, I heard that one of the companies who had been asked to do a pitch didn't, want, didn't actually want to do it. So I phoned up the BBC, because I knew the people. I found out the BBC I, from the Belgrade Theatre because Will and I were doing Ugly Sisters at the time. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, 
asked if we could be included because they knew us because I was a producer of Playdate. Yeah. Uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they sent all the, the, the information out to us, which was quite extensive, I have to say. And there was about 18 companies, I think, asked to, to pitch for it. Um, some of them are quite big companies. And, uh, wow. Well, we didn't expect to get it, of course, because we were such a, we were just, you know, just Will and I and two, two others, you know, with a little office in Leicester Square. Right, okay. Uh, and, uh, but we get, getting, getting down to the, 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 the last 10 and then the last five and then eventually we're down to the last two. Right. And we thought, my goodness, we might just get this. <laughs> Cause we put the tweenies in as an idea. Yeah. We made a little video and that sort of stuff and, uh, and they eventually were called into BBC, and, and it was supposed to be for 130 programs. Right. Still well, quite a lot, still quite a lot. A lot of programs. It was a big commission. Yes. Uh, and then they said we thought they were just, we were just then to be asked to, you know to discuss the budget. Okay. Before they made the final decision, and uh, but they decided they, they they decided on that day to offer it to us. But instead of 130, it says, we're not going to offer you 130. Well, we thought it was because we were just a small company, you know. Yeah, right. they'll, they'll, but then it says, we're going, to, we're going to offer you 260. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we had 260 programs tonight. Goodness me. So we had to gear up very quickly. We had we decided to move to Elstree Film Studios and rent a sound stage there and kick it out. And we we created our own wardrobe and workshops and everything up there. Wow. And uh, we we had to make 70 programs before it went on air. Really? Because they wanted to show them quite quickly. Yeah. So 70 programs, and we didn't even know whether they were going to work. Right. <laughs> um, so luckily they did. Uh, they, were, they went on near uh, Christmas. And, uh, and they hit, so we... They became very popular, and they, they offered us another 160. Yeah. 130, rather. So we did 390 altogether. Wow. Uh, and it was the biggest thing we ever did, really. Yeah. I, um, did, I, I guess, you know, you could never imagine how big something like this is going to be, but it was, you know, the whole franchise itself was just incredible, wasn't it? it I mean, global. It went around the world, didn't it? Yeah, oh yes, it was absolutely global. It went to seventy different territories, and um, we 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 got to stage where actually we could we could get to see anybody, any television producer, any, any television company. Uh, it was a great calling for, card for us. Right. Uh, it was it just worked so well, and we we went all over the world launching it. Yeah. So how did the um, characters come about? Um, because uh, I don't know how true this is, but, you know, the initial characters weren't uh, what they were supposed to be portrayed on screen, were they? Well, there, 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 some of them were quite close. Uh, there was five characters. Well, there, I mean, there was five children originally. Yeah. Uh, because there, there, was, there was Milo, Jack, uh, Jake, um, Fizz and, and Bella. And... But there was also Sid. Ah. Sid was the middle one. He was a little sensitive, kind of right in the middle, okay. a little sensitive chap. And the BBC decided they only wanted four children. Right. So we had to lose one of them. Okay. So we lost Sid. Uh, and then we had, of course, uh, Max and Judy and Doodles. Yes, of course. Um, well, there were, there were two dogs, weren't there, I believe? And eventually, well, they eventually wanted a new character. We wanted to introduce Sid again. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah that would have been <laughs> uh, Yeah, but they decided, no, no, they wanted another dog. So uh, so uh, BBC wanted a dog, so we introduced Izzles. Ah, okay, yes, that's the one. But, um, who was originally called Squiggles, actually. Ah, okay. Um, so I guess you, had you already written for this character Sid before um, the change was made? Uh, only in the trial scripts that we put, we, we, that we put in, uh, the, the, you know, we, we when we talked about when we got the commission, you know, all that was talked about, and they decided they just wanted the four characters. Right. Okay. And I guess 
with a show that has such longevity, again, the characters, um, they progress and the storylines sort of get deeper and more sort of meaningful. I, I guess in the very beginning, because um, all the shows, I believe, were sort of based on the national curriculum and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. But in the very beginning, it was more sort of, it was more of that and then it got more adventurous as the, um, as the series progressed. Oh, definitely. I mean, I mean, we as we got to know the characters more and realised what they can do, and uh, we, we became we, yeah, we became a bit more adventurous with the characters. Yeah, and, and, and of course, we've, we there. Then we decided we wanted to do live tours in, in the of the arenas. Yeah, I went to one of those live tours. Um, I think oh, did it, you? <laughs> it was back in. I think it was in London back in two thousand. I remember it greatly because it was yeah it wasn't like um it wasn't like a, a children's show it was like a a big theatrical performance and they were singing yeah around that time because people forget that the tweenies had performed on the likes of top of the pops and they had all yeah. these big songs that were hitting the charts they were sort of mega stars in their own right yeah they were that's right we did we were on top of the pops two or three times and yeah. um we we decided to, we wanted to do arenas and, and do big, big shows, you know, like almost like big pop concerts, almost big yeah. concerts, but with a story, of course, for the children. And yeah. uh, but we wanted it to be a spectacle. Yeah. So, so we, we had all the people on tour that would be maybe doing Tina Turner one week. Right. <laughs> they, they, they'd come and do the tweenies, you know, after they'd finished that. Wow. And uh, it was all, all the same people who'd be doing all the big, Pop tours that were that were helped doing us. It was, it was it was a great great experience. Yeah, I mean those were the days with music where you know the likes of Mr. Blobby could uh, have a hit, and then all of a sudden you see <laughs> Jake singing about bananas. I mean that's the you know, honestly. I mean that was proper music back then. I mean I remember that song really well. Um, but um, and people may be quite interested to know that um, the voice of Jake was actually Justin Fletcher once again. Justin Fletcher, yes, he did the voice of Jake and Doodles. And Doodles, yeah, and again, yeah. and again, Doodles started out as this sort of dog that didn't really have a lot of dialogue. He wasn't really brought no. in to speak, and then, and then, uh, what was the um, what what was the decision to make him this sort of character who could then speak? Well, he became really popular with the children. Yeah, they loved Doodles. They thought Doodles, and and Doodles became a bit of a confidant for Jake, you know. Yes, that's right. Uh, so, uh, so we decided to just to make him a little bit more of a character. And Doodles, and and Doodles really became one of the favourites. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting you mentioned about the sort of, you know, characters and confidants and throughout these podcasts, you know, a lot of the programs that we talk about, you know, focus on children's mental health and that sort of thing. And, and tweenies, again, like, you know, some of the other programs I, I've been talking about in, you know, my other podcasts, very much so tweenies was at the centre of children's mental health, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, we tried to cover quite a lot. I mean, I mean, the, the program was supposed to cover lots and lots of different issues and 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 the curriculum and and aspects of children growing up. It was quite a wide brief right. for for the program. So we did have to try and include lots of things like that. Yeah. And safety programs and things. We did safety programs and all sorts of things like that. Right, okay. Yeah, um, and we... I mean, they, they represented sort of different areas uh, uh, as far as the age group was concerned. Like Jake was the youngest and Bella was the oldest. Right. And and um, we, we we deliberately made them different colours because we don't, didn't want the race thing. Right. Um, they, could, they could have been anything, really. And um, uh, we, we also, because we also tackled things like uh, Hanukkah and Eid and, and, and you know, the... the Festival of Light, all that sort of stuff, we do, uh, as well as Christian, you know, Christmas and all that sort of yeah, stuff. And yeah. uh, we, we tackled as many different things as we possibly could. Mm. Uh, and because it was four children in a room, and and how they related to the, the, each other, how they related to the adults, and how they related to the children, right? Uh, to, to the uh, the animals. Yes. Then we it was. Uh, nothing was out of bounds, really. 
And, and, and it's important, I think, to base them in reality. Right. I mean, of course, of course, it's a heightened reality, but but it was important to base them in that that reality so we could deal with real issues. Yes. Yeah. And I guess it sort of depends on, I guess, the director that you have, and there's always going to be some little um, contradictions in, in, in a long-running programme. So, so I mean, we were, very, we were very lucky with the directors. We chose them very carefully, and right. and I produced all 390 programmes. Right. So so I, I kept a very close eye on it. Right. Uh, also, the voices uh, for, of the characters and the people who played the characters in the in the uh, costumes, where uh, we, we had the, we had the same people all the way through. Oh, did you? Apart from Bella's voice, we changed we changed the girl who did Bella's voice. That was all. And the costumes sort of changed as well over the years, didn't they? Well, we changed the heads, uh, and the costumes we tried to keep as much because we we got this. Uh, four-way stretch material from America. Oh, right. And, uh, which we used, and we, we we bought it in bulk, so we had that we, for all the costumes that we made. Um, but um, the, the heads we redid at one point, because when we started, there were about 12 kilos. Oh, wow. Uh, full of animatronics. So uh, we managed to get all that down to nine kilos. Right. Uh, so we, we, did, we did redo the heads at one point. Because um, the Tweenies sort of ran for so long and it was repeated for many years after, people seem to think that, you know, it had such a longevity on TV. But actually, you know, it was only ever broadcast for a short period of time, wasn't it? Well, it, they, when we started to do it, uh, the BBC told us they thought it was a five-year brand. Right. And that's what they were, they, they were basing the five-year brand on. Right. Uh, but it actually, it actually run for 10 years. Do you ever find that, you know, when you sort of say to people casually, or oh, hi, I'm Ian Luxon, I created the tweenies. Do you ever find that, that, you know, people go, what, you created the tweenies? Oh, people can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Is it, it, must be, it must be quite a, a strange thing for you because, of course, they know you for as a presenter and you know as somebody yeah. that's been on stage and then and then it must be difficult because if you sort of walk down the street somebody might say oh yes you're from play school or you're from the fun song factory but they wouldn't really know that you were the creator of that that's sort of a secret thing that's that right have, which is probably that's really right nice isn't it yeah yeah absolutely it's just some, quite often people will be working with me for quite a while before they realize <laughs> yes and then all of a sudden they're like Oh, wow. Okay, now what do I say here? <laughs> uh, yes. um, but you went on to produce lots of other um, different programs. Um, you know, you produced some cartoon shows as well, didn't you? Yeah, we did BBCB and we did Wibbly Pig. That's right. And we did, and we did a program called Boo, ah, which was yes. very successful, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Jim Jam and Sunny, which was like another big, uh, almost like the a tree with animatronic characters. So who voiced uh, Jim Jam and Sonny? Um, well, uh, Justin did one of them again. I um, say that, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I'm trying to... My, um, my daughter, actually, my daughter Morna did one of them. Oh, really? Oh, how, how fantastic. Because yeah. Morna, my daughter, was actually in Doodles for all the live shows. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so she she was doodles for all the live shows. What a proud daddy you must be. <laughs> yes. That must be incredible to have your sort of daughter sort of playing out on stage, you know, the character that you created. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it, was fant it was fantastic, really. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned Justin quite a few times. I mean, he's, his voice is very, very distinct, so you can almost sort of hear him in whatever he does, um, which is quite yeah, interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So um, I mean, since then, since then he's become Mr. Tumble and everything. So he's, he's become a kind of children's superstar, hasn't oh, he? Oh, he has. You know, he's got an MBE. He's got everything now. I think it's he's, he's done incredible. You know. Yeah, no, very much so. As, as, we we very much concentrated on the preschool uh, age age range, you know, and really concentrated on doing. I mean, BBC was a little bit older. 
I it was uh, it, it, it was about sibling rivalry. Right. Uh, we, and we always try to, for each of our programs, we always try to have a reason for being, you know. It wasn't just, mm. let's do a program around this teddy bear or whatever. We decided, right, we want to do a program on sibling rivalry. Right. We want to do a program on... Um, listening skills or, yeah. uh, you know, or, or hide and seek or, or, or that sort of stuff. We, we always had a reason for being for the show. Yeah. Um, out of all of yeah. the sort of programs that we've spoken about, you know, in 2021, you know, um, what sort of program, if maybe all of them, but what, what sort of program could you see making a return to TV? I think, I think there's always a place for, I mean, when I, when I watch children's television, there's quite a few children's programs based on the idea of tweenies. Right, okay. You know, with a, with a group of children who are together, uh, you know, with a, uh, someone looking after them and uh, and they, they learn something each program. I mean, like Hey Dougie, for example. Oh, right, okay. You know, so it's very much a, a sort of... Uh, Based on 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 the tweenies, what the tweenies represented is for you know, a group of children just learning about things, you know. Right. So you would see perhaps that maybe making a return. I think so. I mean, it would, it would need a bit of work, and I think certainly to bring it more up a little bit more up to date. But I think that that, that format kind of would work. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there is um, a television show out there that is like that. Um, and I and I don't think there ever will be a television show that that can um, that would be like that. Yeah, I mean, I say, I don't. I I think you're right. I don't think programs like um, Teletubbies and the Tweenies. I don't think that sort of phenomenon will happen again. Right. I just think it is a different time. Well, there's a lot of and the ch children's there. market. Yeah, and the children's market has changed completely. Really, the. The model we used to work on to make these programs work, uh, you know, to get the money together for them and to get them distributed. Right, okay. And all that, that, that model's kind of broken now. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I we don't so. have, we used to have the cornerstones of publishing, right. DVDs, right. Um, toys, right. and, and distribution of the programs. Well, most of the big distributors have gone now. They, you know, they don't exist anymore, and you know DVD doesn't really exist anymore. No. HSL, certainly VHS doesn't really exist anymore. No, it doesn't. No. And 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 DVD is not really as strong as it used to be. No, it's all so, and, and, and yeah, and there's no money. There's not as much money in publishing these days. So the, the cornerstones of getting your budget together and contracts to 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 make your budget, you know, don't exist anymore. It, it's all about um, online now and streaming platforms online and a lot of CGI animation that's on TV now and cartoons and that sort of thing. There's a lot of animations happening. There is. Uh, because they're easier to revoice for other countries. Uh, and there's no, there's, there's no lip sync or anything like that. Right. And the music can be re re redone quite easily. And uh, it's... it's it's just easier to 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 get them distributed around the world, and um, if they're car if they're animations, yeah. uh, whereas if they're live action, it throws up a lot more a lot more problems. Uh, but mm. having said that, I think I think live action presenter led program uh, is the, what we should be having. Uh, we should be having more of that than cartoons. I mean, I think. Uh, I think presenter-led programs can still be relevant and still be done in a in an up up to date way. Yes. I mean, I, I have my Cheeky Chimps TV series um, a channel on in the internet, yes, and all my programs are presenter-led. Put a, a link there for people to go and see. I think if you want some real homegrown children's television from from a, a, a man that knows about children's TV and how it should be done, then um, introduce your kids to to everything that Ian's doing. Because at the moment, you know, it's better than the animations that we see uh, on some of these networks. So, no, thank you. Yeah. Oh no. Well, um, I'm very uh, humbled that you were able to um, talk to me about all of this stuff. It's been a real uh, honour to speak to you. We're going to move on um, and talk a little bit about 
not the programs that you sort of what um, sort of starred in or created, but the little Ian Luchlin sitting at home, you know, on his television, you know, um, sort of in front of the box. What was what was your weekly fixture? What were you like as a child in terms of what you watched on TV? We only had some some uh, some programs at one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And then and then fifty five minutes of programs just before the news, you know, at five o'clock. I see. That's that's the only children's programs that were on television. Oh, okay, wow. And so the ones in the afternoon were watched with mother, which were was uh, you know, like Andy Pandy, yes. Picture Book, yes. um Bill and Ben, Ragtag and Bob Till and uh, and uh, and the wooden jobs on the Friday. Um, you mentioned that you were sort of involved in sort of programs like that yourself. You did um, Finger Mouse, and as I believe, Finger Mouse was a character that was on television before sort of you presented it. Yeah, it was called Finger Bobs. Uh, it was presented by Rick Morgan. Okay. Uh, who actually was a placeable presenter as well. Right. Uh, and uh, he did the first series of uh, called Finger Bobs. Um, and uh, the producer. Michael Cole, who was a lovely, lovely man. He, he did a lots of children's programs. Um, he decided he wanted to bring it up to date and redo it and make it uh, a presenter who was a, 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 he, he had a, a musical instrument workshop. He used to, he used to uh, repair instruments. Oh. And he, 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 it was going to be uh, Finger Mouse and and another little rat character. And it, we would have part of the program in the workshop or a specific instrument for that day, which might be a sitar or a, a, a trumpet or something like that that I was repairing. And then the program, then he would go off and have a list, this little adventure um, with the other puppets, uh, which was related to the actual musical instrument. Oh, wow. And so, so he wanted to redo it, and, and it was his wife who made the puppets. She was a designer, and uh, Michael Cole's wife made all the paper puppets. Oh. Uh, and I, I only did, I only ever did eight finger mouse programs. Did you? Yeah, it was, it was, it's the thing that people would recognise me most from. Yes. And I only ever did eight programs. Yes, I was going to uh, but say, it, yeah. it, it was repeated over and over again. And um, it was very sad because in the middle of the series, Michael's wife, who was a designer, died. Oh, okay. She got cancer and she died very suddenly. Right. In the middle of the series. So uh, it's, it's always changed the sadness, that series, for me. But um, it was, as I say, it wasn't a long series. Right. But it was very, very enjoyable, really, with Michael, because he's such a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, and as you said, uh, it's quite surprising, but although you only did eight episodes, it's the one thing that, you know, that generation of people will recognise you from. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was, I mean, I, the number of drinks I've had from Finger Mouse is amazing. <laughs> yeah. you, know, standing, you know, sitting in a pub, yeah. uh, people coming up and saying to me, you know, did you, you know, were you think about some of that stuff? Right. I, I was the thing that people recognised me, I think, most of it, most for. Do you, do you often find that a bit um, strange when sort of people uh, come up to you in the streets and, you know, say, oh, it's you, I, I recognise you? Because it's, I guess it's very different for somebody that's sort of doing the voice of something or a puppet because they, they know the voice, but they don't recognise the face. But with you very much, you've, you've got this sort of recognisable face that people would instantly go, oh, yes, I remember you. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's still amazes me that people do still do it, you know, and I just think, my goodness, I'm, I get a bit older now, so, uh, but right. um, people guess, still come up and say hello. And I guess you're very humbled by that. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I think it's a very privileged position to be in. Right, yeah. Um, you mentioned um, you, your sort of Cheeky Chimps TV, and you, but you're, you're very much sort of working behind the scenes, working, producing children's programming. You're still in the centre of children's TV, and you're, as well as Cheeky Chimps TV, you're producing some um, books that are coming out soon, aren't you? 
Yes, that's right. My cheeky chimps is still an ongoing thing, so I decided to, you know, make make my own channel so I could make my own programs. And um, so that that's kind of ongoing. But um, recently, I, I because I have my own TV studio, I uh, did a, a promo. I, I made a promo for a, a series of bears called the Mood Bears. It was brought to me by a lady called Joe Proud, and she she introduces she she got these bears made. They all represent a, a mood, like the sad bear and happy bear. Okay. There's uh, you know the silly bear, and there's hope bear, and there's, there's a whole range of them. They're lovely bears, right. and she wanted me to do a promo for her because she sells them online. So I did that, and it. it she was very pleased with it. And she asked me if I'd write her uh, mood bear book ah. because it's all about children's mental health. Okay. Uh, what she she gets what she does is she gets people to sponsor the bears, right? And she gives them to hospitals uh, so cool. that when the, when children have been in for an operation or uh, have got mental health issues or something, right. the, the hospital have them, gives them a bear. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and so, uh, so, so the bears get given out to children once they've, if they've been through an operation or something. Yes. And uh, so she, that's what, so I've decided I'd write a book for her, hopefully one of a series. But um, I decided to do one on loss. Right. You know, like it was, it was a little lad who had lost his his old dog. Yeah. Uh, who who died, and uh, and it's just how the. The mood bears help him through mm. just the feelings of losing losing some uh, someone someone they loved, right. and so this is being published on the twelfth of August mm -hmm. so by by uh, Cherish Publishing, and uh, I'm really really pleased. It's my first book. Oh. I'm really really looking forward to it. Wow, your first book, and and long awaited as well. And I think a a, a really a really good subject to focus on children's mental health i i think there's there's nothing really out there like that and and with all things i think there's room for sort of uh, progression and uh, we hope that the the book sells well and i'm sure it will but um do you do you envisage maybe taking what you've done maybe onto the screens yes it's, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, joe proud emailed me just last week saying can we meet because i'd like to Perhaps do something uh, with the mood bears. Perhaps put them on screen. Oh wow! So that so we're going to meet up and see if she. If, I think she wants perhaps me to do an animation series of it. Right. Uh, but uh, we'll have a chat with her and see what she says. I mean, I'm also in touch with Linda Beckett, who has done a couple of books right. on mental health for uh, Archie the Bear as well. So she wants something done as well. Right. So it's, it's useful having the TV studio because I can I can actually make and use the experience I've had for making children's programs yeah. if people want to come and bring ideas to me, you know. That, that's something we'll definitely look out for. Um, and as you mentioned in the very beginning of the podcast, you are looking forward to getting back on stage and doing panto. Yeah, very much so. So hopefully, <laughs> yes, so hopefully um, and... Uh, I might be hearing that I have first place ticket in the front row for that, Ian. <laughs> yes, um, I'll be sort of waving. You don't know me. You haven't seen my face, but it's me. Um, no, no, that's right. You, you, you must let me know when you're coming. Yes, I'll just sort of wave and go, it's me, Fun Song Factory boy, you know, fanboy. But, um, but definitely, um, I'll, I'll definitely take a, a trip down. It'd just be nice to get out, really, after all of this time. It's just nice to go no. to the theatre and, you know, and I guess, you know, all of those measures are going to be put in place to make sure people are safe. And I guess doing pan to mime this year you know the way it's going to happen is going to be slightly different for you as a as a cast yeah yeah so as we were just talking through it see i mean there's a possibility we may have to still self-distance by december but they're hoping right. not to be able to self-distance right. since most people will have been vaccinated by that time yes and also they're talking about giving us boosters uh, but the the diff the Differences. We're not sure whether we can have a children's chorus yet, or uh, just that there's something still up in the air about it. But we'll definitely be doing a pantomime. Oh, that's brilliant! Because I know from a few people who've done pantomime last year, they sort of said, you know, 
they rely on the audience's reactions and for them to call out and for them to... Oh, it's just imperative. And yes, it's so, so integral. And you just can't, you can't really, without that, you can't really get the feel of what a pantomime is, can you? Absolutely. Yeah, we de- yeah, the, you just need the audience. Yes. And we need them in f- full capacity, you know, being able to join in and enjoy themselves and laugh. And, uh, you know, it's yeah. not something you can perhaps really do if you're under a mask or socially distanced. So we just, no, hope, I know. We just hope and and there's no doubt that the theatres are going to do things safely. So I believe oh, definitely. it's just about trusting these industries, you know, and just yeah. putting your trust into them and saying, well, actually, you know, trust us. You know, we we look at all the science right now and we look at all of the data for various things. And yes, we need that. But the theatres are saying, you know what, we can do this safely. Let us have the chance to do it. And let's bring the joy to, you know, millions of children and their families again. You know, at Christmas, it's a it's an event that happens every year. And, you know, we want to get back to see it. So uh, fingers crossed and, you know, um, please, God, that we'll be able to do that this year. Definitely. Let's hope so. Yes. Uh, it's been fascinating uh, talking to you, Ian. Um, two hours shorter than I was with my previous guest. Um, but, um, <laughs> but yes, that's um, you can guess who that is, Zippy. Um, I don't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has, and, and as I said, I don't hold back in saying that, you know, in the world of theatre, in the world of, you know, children's television, you know, you're a true hero and a national treasure to a lot of people. And uh, long, Thank you. well, you're welcome. And long, long may you know the success come, and you know perhaps one day we might see um, a remake of the Tweenies. You know, you heard it here first. Never say never. <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm going to ask you one question, as I ask all of the guests. Um, we mentioned a little bit. You mentioned Watch with Mother and all those programs that you used to watch. Um, if you were to choose a a television theme that we were to play out on. Uh, today for this podcast, uh, what would it be? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, there is a program which sticks in my mind and always is stuck in my mind. And I think it's influenced me with all the slapstick that was involved in it. Right. And because I, I love doing cancer and things. And it was called Mr. Pastry. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know whether you'll have ever heard of it, Sean, but it was called Mr. Pastry. And he was one of these slapstick characters who, who rode around on a bike and got into all sorts of trouble. Wow. Uh, real comedy program. It's called Mr. Pastry, if you can ever find it. Well, we certainly will do that, and we'll have the theme to Mr. Pastry playing us out. Um, no, <laughs> no doubt. Um, yes, um, and you are right. I don't think I have heard of it. But uh, I, I'm going to go home tonight with interest, and, I, and I'm going to watch Mr. Pastry, and I'm going to think, ah, Ian Lachlan actually introduced me to Mr. Pastry. Um, yes, and You'll I, love it. You'll I will love it. And so, yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Ian. Uh, Ian Lachlan, you have been my guest, and you have been fabulous. Thank you.